Hi everyone. I'm the director for our New Zealand not-for-profit charitable trust called Common Knowledge, and we hold all of the birthing better skills that hundreds of moms and dads developed in the United States in the early 1970s for absolutely all births without exception. And today I want to talk to you about your obstetrician in your hospital. The, the reality is, is that I want to see how do I explain this? When I gave birth in the United States in 1970, there were no choices for us as birthing women. It was follow your doctor's orders, and we went in and had the assessments and monitoring and procedures of that time. We didn't have any choices about it. But there were the very first childbirth preparation classes being taught, and they were entirely skills based. Lamas and Bradley, and fathers were coming in because we wanted them to help us. What did we want them to help us do? We wanted help, and they wanted us to help us cope better so we didn't suffer in childbirth. What we discovered was that we had seen our obstetrician throughout pregnancy, and then they came in at some point to check us in the birth, and then we didn't see him again until the delivery. So we were basically left alone. Staff would come in every two to four hours and do something, and we were just left alone because childbirth is a normal life event. In the 1980s, when I gave birth last, there was a different evidence-based practice in the United States. We still saw our obstetricians, unless we were with a midwife, and we still went to the hospital, although the standards of care and guidelines to practice had greatly changed because of my generation in the 70s, who had coped better. So we had more choices, and that was being advocated as choices through a birth plan. And this is where it started to all dissolve. Now, over the 50 years that I have been involved in the childbirth conversation, I have been criticized by many that I am criticizing the natural birth movement. So you need to understand that words are very, very important. What I and the hundreds and hundreds of families who develop birthing better skills are doing is reflecting on the messages that are being given to us so we reflect on the messages being given by the medical profession, which isn't much, right? So, and we're reflecting on the natural birth movement, which is a lot. And what we've discovered is, particularly with the natural birth movement, is that those messages, when we reflect on them, have had very negative, unintended consequences. One of them started in the 1970s, when we began, my generation began to hear that obstetricians were basically wandering down the street with a knife in their hand, ready to slice us open to do a cesarean. And that all they wanted to do was rush out and go to the golf course. So I just need to explain to you what I, as the director of Common Knowledge Trust, have learned from tens and thousands of birth stories in 50 years. First of all, obstetricians are just human beings. They're men and women. They're very dedicated. Some are absolute jerks. Some are absolutely wonderful. Some would like to be very much, have a broader understanding of things, and others stick to the protocols, the evidence-based practice, the standards of care, and the guidelines of practice of their profession, or the hospitals where they deliver in. And this is true around the world. Every maternity system is a wee bit different. The United States, there weren't midwives, although there are now. In other countries, that mostly it was midwives who were attending you in birth, and you rarely saw an obstetrician unless you had risks. So when you're thinking about your relationship to your obstetrician in the hospital, you can go down the rabbit hole of whether they are going to give you the birth you want or whether you're going to get what you want or have what you don't want, or you can focus on a much bigger reality which is that you're going to give birth. 100% of pregnant women are going to give birth, and they have since the beginning of humanity, around the world and in diverse cultures, with or without midwives, with or without obstetricians, with or without hospitals, whether they stayed at home or went off by themselves or went to a birth hut. We give birth. What's us, women? We're the only ones doing it with our baby. And it is an activity. Now, People have difficulty understanding when our trust and the thousands and thousands of birthing better families refer to birth as an activity. 
It's much like driving a car. You get in a car and you do an activity over time and over distance. Birth isn't over distance usually, it's over time. But you have to do it. In other words, you're doing it whether you have skills or not. You're doing it whether you like it or not. You're doing it whether you have an obstetrician or not. You're doing it if you have an obstetrician you like or not, or whether your obstetrician is there or not. You're doing it whether you like what's happening in the hospital or not. You're doing it. You're doing it whether you have risks. You're doing it if you have no risks. You're doing it whether you like what's happening to you or hate what's happening to you. We have to do it. Nobody else is doing it. And our trust has always said to people, look, it's very, very clear. <clears throat> if we did birth as often as we eat, we would have hundreds of books that gave us skills. Hundreds of them. But because it's infrequent, and because it's a one-off, and because it can't be repeated, and because we never know what our birth is going to be like, and because it's life-transforming, and because the unintended consequences of the natural birth movement that basically said that because women have always birthed, we then automatically know how to birth. And that's not accurate. Some women birth very easily, and some women struggle. And it has zero to do with risks and zero to do with your viewpoint. It really, if you labor, has to do with how easily your baby fits through your body. Because that makes sense. You have a big object in a, your container. And if it's easy to fit through it, it's going to come through it easily. And if, there, if it's big or some other factor, then it may take longer. So who is your obstetrician? Well, a mother or a father or a son or a daughter or a husband or a wife, a human being who's in a highly skilled profession. And they have standards of care. And this is where the obstetrical profession and us as consumers have this peculiar relationship. We as consumers, particularly since the Second World War, and more so since women had birth control and we could limit the size of our children, and more so since modern women became more risk averse, we then expected that this precious child of ours that could have immunizations and not die before the age of five of a child, childhood disease, that that child is very precious. Time before that, in the 19th century, 18th century, go all the way back when there was no birth control when we often had very large families and we expected 20 to 30 percent of our children to die before the age of five due to childbirth illnesses. We had more children to replace them. And we accepted those tragedies. We accepted those risks. We accepted that. And we didn't have obstetricians. We either birthed on our own <coughs> family member or in some rare cases we were in societies where there was a special person who attended births. <clears throat> but just because there was a special person who attended births didn't mean that we loved birth or didn't suffer or that we didn't have risks or our risks didn't turn into problems or our problems didn't turn into tragedies. So the modern society advanced. And one of the hallmarks of living in a first world country was that we had modern health care. And so we, as consumers, really demanded, it wasn't just around birth, we have demanded that doctors take care of us. And obstetricians just happened to be a specialist with women's health issues as a gynecologist and obstetrician around pregnancy and birth. But in birth, we're going to see them very infrequently. And so we have to continue to do this activity. And if we're doing this activity of birthing our baby in a hospital under obstetrical care, who's going to come into the room? And that's going to be the staff, either labor and delivery nurses or midwives on staff. And what are they going to do? They're not going to do the birth for us. We have to do it. 
they're going to come in and do the assessments, monitoring procedures. And if those are things you don't want, don't go in there. It's as simple as that. Once you do go in there, then that's the guidelines of practice, the standards of care, or the evidence-based practice of the day. And they expect to do that. So another unintended negative consequence of the natural birth movement was to say that you know what kind of birth you want. You should tell them what to give you. And they can't because there's no way to know what your birth's going to be like. And no obstetrician and no hospital is going to bend outside of what they're legally responsible to do. So if you don't want this, 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 don't go into the hospital. It's as simple as that. And if you do go into the hospital, then you have to work with and work around the assessments, the monitoring and procedures that you're going to experience. So how do you do that from our viewpoint as common knowledge trust? Well, you do it what the hundreds of mothers and fathers decided to develop in the early 70s, skills, birth skills, birth coaching skills. And why did we do that? Because we realized any of us who had already done the birth, given birth, gone through birth, whether we labored and had an unplanned cesarean, whether we labored and had a vaginal birth, whether we had a non-laboring cesarean, whether we were trying to have a VBAC and had one of those three combinations, it was an activity. And the skills fortunately developed before the message came down through the natural birth movement that women instinctively knew how to birth because just because we get pregnant. So birthing better skills actually developed in the 10 years before that message. And we developed it at a time when there was at the end of the skills-based childbirth trend in the United States, there was Lamaze and Bradley. And why did birthing better skills develop if we already had skills? Because whenever you start something new, and trust me, Lamaze and Bradley was very new globally. There were no cultures that taught people how to birth. Every culture had things that you shouldn't, shouldn't do during pregnancy and with a newborn. But during birth, humans just went into theirs, no way to know what your birth's going to be like, and then tagged on this sentence. Therefore, there's nothing you can really do to prepare for it. Well, that's not really accurate. And what it is, this is an activity. So what you can do to prepare for it, along with everything else you do or don't do, is to learn skills. And those skills are focused on a bunch of different parts of doing that activity. One is our body is a container, so that if we recognize it as a container with a big object inside it, which men understand, because if you say to a man, hey, dude, what if this big object the size of a grapefruit was coming down through and out your penis? They'd get it. It's just happening inside us, so we don't see it. But it's still a big object, and we can feel it when we're pregnant. Our belly's big. The baby's big. It doesn't turn into a toothpaste tube to come out of us and then explode once it's born. That object has to open up a very tight sphincter that's called the cervix, and then that object has to come down through a bony tube, our pelvis, then that object has to come down a soft tube, which is of our vagina. But in doing that, it has to turn the corner under our pubic bone and face towards your vaginal opening if you labor and have a vaginal birth. All those pieces, parts of us can be prepared. And they can be prepared from 24 weeks onward. And our VJJ, as Oprah calls it, can be prepared from 32 weeks onward. How much time does this take? Well, to prepare down there, either we do it ourselves or our partner helps it five minutes a day. Can you afford that to prevent that big object from being delayed or that big object from tearing you or that big object because you're tight requiring you to be cut down there and stitched? Can you spend five minutes a day for eight weeks? We should. And how much time does it take to prepare our body for birth at 24 weeks? Well, I don't know, 
10 minutes every two or three days? <laughs> How much time? Not a hell of a lot. And then we have to learn skills. So we have to learn good breathing skills that can adapt to the different sensations we feel or help us cope when things externally are impacting us. That's a good idea. Good breathing skills that adapt and adjust and are sustainable. Good idea. How about relaxation skills? If this big object has to open us up and it hurts if we labor and we tense up in reaction to pain, as all humans do, they go into fright, flight, freeze, or fight, or moan, or groan, or scream, or look ragged and exhausted. So if we learn how to relax and open up and keep our body open for this big object, then that big object is going to move down through and out us more effectively. Well, that's good. What about good communication with our birth coach, our partner, or someone else? We don't want them to be just standing there and supporting us. It's like standing behind us as we're changing the nappies. We want them to know how to do it. And men, all men, were born through a woman's body. So the reality is, is that men understand birth very, very, very well. And they want to know how to help us. We don't have skills. They don't have skills. And we don't have skills innately to teach them how to help us. So birthing better fathers and mothers develop skills so that we could share a common set of skills. And how can we do that as men and women? It's simple. We all blink. We all cough. We can all tighten up our rectum. We have very few differences. And 100% of us as pregnant women will give birth. So the people with us can have skills to help us cope. How do they know how to help us cope? Because they can see and hear whether we're coping or not. It's obvious. It's obvious. And so we have breathing skills, communication skills, relaxation skills. We have skills that help us know how to tell whether our labor is effective or progressive. That's not hard because every contraction has to then have a peak. And contractions that don't have a peak are indicating that the baby is saying to us, hey, mom, you're either in a position I don't like, or you have an internal tension, which I'm trying to resolve, or you're compressing my space in some way in how you sit or that you're pressing on it, or you're bending in a way that I don't particularly like. So when you sort those small things out and the labor begins to have a peak, then you can have a progressive labor. And what about contractions? We've spent gazillion years just calling it a contraction. The natural birth movement sometimes says, don't call it a contraction, call it a rush or a wave. But the fact is, is if it gets really, really intense, it's like a big wave that's going to slam you or a rush that's going to push you right out the door. Yet once we started to think about it, we realized it had five phases. It started, it started to build, it had a peak, it started to go away and it went away. So that meant we could apply skills in any of those five phases. So what about the fact that we're having a non-laboring cesarean? Well, it's still going to be an activity. So you learn the skills to do this activity. And you use the skills on the way to the hospital. Is it going to take you two seconds to get to the hospital? Maybe. Maybe it's going to take you an hour and a half to get to the hospital. It's your labor. So use your breathing, relaxation, communication skills, if nothing else. You're going to be prepped. How long is it going to take you to prep? get prepped? Well, depends. Depends on how busy the hospital is. Depends on whether... They've scheduled you for a particular time or a particular day, how long you wait. So keep using your skills. It's still an activity over time you're doing. And if you get separated, both of you use your skills in your separate rooms because you're working together. Why are you working together? Because you're parents. Well, no, you say you're a parent once the baby's born. Why is that? You're a parent once you got, pre once you got pregnant. And so... Do you, are you going to use skills to parent after your baby's born? 
Of course you are, just like all of us. And that's why we developed skills so that we were parenting during our pregnancy and birth. So we could use skills to prepare for the birth and in birth. And what we found by using skills around our obstetricians, around the staff and in the hospital and wired with every single hole filled with a tube or wire, didn't matter. We were still doing the activity. And why did we do it? Because we got pregnant to have a baby. We're a parent. That's what our children expect of us. And we felt more empowered and more in control. And what did the obstetrician think of us as skilled families or the staff? They loved it. They loved working with us. My goodness, they wished everybody was skilled. They just don't think it's their role in their professional capacity to tell us to become skilled. Our trust would like them to. Our trust would like every birth professional to say to every expectant parent, hey, you're going to do this activity, self-learn some skills and use skills to work through the activity. We'd love that. We'd even love them to give you a handout of the various skills-based methods that they know about. We'd love that. But in our 50 years of experience working around obstetricians, we found they don't feel that that's part of their professional, I don't know, purview. So as consumers, we have to spread that. Or childbirth educators, or doulas, or midwives, sisters, brothers, aunts, or uncles. So your obstetrician, is he going to negotiate with you if you have high risks and you want a very natural birth in the hospital? Well, it depends on how you're behaving. And the natural birth movement would criticize that statement by saying women can behave any way they want. But we discovered that when we were coping and managing and feeling in control, that people who were around us saw that. It wasn't that we were behaving as good little girls. It was that we were behaving in a skilled manner to do the activity of birthing our baby. And when we were doing that, and we were coming into the hospital with heaps of risks, even though perhaps in the antenatal um, sessions with our obstetrician, they were saying, well, I'm not really supportive of a VBAC, or you know, you, you're having twins, or you're having a breach, or you have a partial placenta priva, or any of the other multiple risks you could have, and that, that there are going to be assessments and monitoring procedures done. When we got into birth, when we were doing the activity of birth, and when the staff and the obstetricians saw us coping really, really, really well, and the assessments of our baby or ourselves as they monitor us seemed fine, they were fine with letting us continue. They were absolutely fine with it. And we, as skilled families also reassured our obstetricians antenatally. We understood that they would just sort of sometimes roll their eyes or some would say, that's nice that you're skilled. But they didn't think that skills would matter much, particularly in the general scope of things because there's no way to know what your birth's gonna be like. But when we did learn skills, particularly for those of us that had risks, and particularly with multiple risks. When we said to our obstetrician, I know that I have X, Y, and Z, and my partner and I are becoming skilled, or I'm becoming skilled as a solo mom, and I want you to know that I want to try to do this birth naturally, and I need you to know that I'm never going to risk myself or my baby for the ideology of a natural birth. However, when you come to the birth, it, if I'm coping well, and if everything looks okay, I just want you to work with me to have as natural birth as possible. And if I, as a mom, feel there's something the matter with me or my baby, I'm going to let you know. And if you, as my obstetrician, feel that there's something wrong with me and my baby, I want you to let me know, and then we'll discuss it. 
If I look out of control and overwhelmed, I can understand why it's hard for you to keep letting me go on and on. However, if I'm coping well, then when everything looks well, I just want to keep going. And we did brilliantly. Does that mean we were perfect in how we use skills? <laughs> no, we didn't have to be perfect. We just had to feel in control. We could go in and get out of control a little bit, come back in control because we knew how to do that. How were our husbands and partners as skilled birth coaches? Absolutely brilliant because they're seeing us from the outside. So they can see those subtle changes that we don't always recognize from when we're coping to almost not coping. And they can help right away rather than let us go further and further outside of coping or managing. So what's our trust philosophy about obstetricians? Human beings have skills, have a profession. They're working in with the standards of care and the guidelines of their practice, the guidelines of their hospital. If you can pick the people you like or the hospital you want, great. If you don't want to be there, don't be there. And if you're there, be highly skilled because we just, it just had the most amazing births. And we continued to use our skills no matter how it unfolded. That was our commitment. Our commitment was to just skillfully birth our baby in all circumstances. And so we did. And so why are, is our trust through me doing all these you and childbirth series? Because we need to change the childbirth conversation. It, it got off to a wrong foot <laughs> when I, in the 60s and the 70s when I gave birth because Lamaz and Bradley focused on only low-risk women. The skills weren't great, and they had three narrow goals, a natural birth, which nobody ever identified what the word natural meant, pain-free labor, which for most women was unrealistic, and without any medical care. And for modern women, that was unrealistic. So those three goals were hard to achieve. Had they said back then, because they were obstetricians, 100% <laughs> of pregnant women are going to give birth. We'll make skills for everybody. Because the biggest thing we see with women is suffering. Totally unrelated. No risks at all. They just suffer. They don't know how to cope. And so if we just had a goal of reducing suffering for, in all births, I wouldn't be talking to you today because you'd be three generations down the message that says it's normal and natural when you're pregnant to self-learn birth skills. And probably there'd be a hundred books on birth skills by now, which there aren't because not enough women achieve those narrow goals and you left out everybody else. And so when the natural birth movement became global in the 1980s, they then were very anti-medical, and part of the unintended negative consequences on reflection was that makes it hard for us as women, particularly if we're birthing in a hospital with an obstetrician. We're already being told by other women, you're not really having a birth. But we are having a birth. It's our baby's birth. So... Obstetricians are just human beings. You gotta work with them. Some are easy to work with, some aren't. <laughs> However, let me tell you this, that's been true for the past 50 years. And when we've gone in at being skilled, even if they've laughed at us, and yet we've shown them during the activity we're doing, they've always been impressed. And they have always negotiated with us as long as the assessments show that we and our baby are fine. So that's final last word. Okay? You don't have to give them flowers. You can love them if you want or hate them. doesn't matter. They're not doing the activity of birthing your baby. You are. I did. <laughs> and you can. Just become skilled. If you choose to use Birthing Better online birth classes, we'd love that. If you want to use another skills-based method, 
do that to your baby's birth. You're parenting your child through pregnancy and birth. Do it with skills. See you later.